about the same way uh, that last Monday, not yesterday, the previous Monday, we started, okay? Okay. Uh, this summer, school focuses on human behavior that fails to be fully rational, okay? That's what Professor Maskin said, and he's the boss, <laughs> okay? So uh, that's... Uh, well, we'll, well, let's go on, we'll see. Rational, r rational okay, it, now, this is a definition of rational. Rational de decision-making is decisions that maximize the agent's payoff, given her belief about the consequences of those decisions, okay? Uh, we know from uh, behavioral economics, that's the part of the title of my talk in psychology and neuroscience, that people's actual behavior is often not rational in this sense. Um, well, we're going to concentrate on the behavioral economics. Uh, um, uh, sentence, part of the words, uh, we're the part of that sentence, and we're we're going to examine whether we agree with that, <laughs> okay? But actual behavior, uh, we heard uh, eight days ago, is not completely arbitrary. It comes from somewhere, <laughs> okay? The point of view today, that was eight days ago, <laughs> yes, uh, that is that behavior comes from evolution. Okay, uh, and we evolved certain behaviors because they worked well in circumstances we found ourselves in. That was eight days ago, okay? Today we say it a little differently. We go along with the first line that behavior comes from evolution, but not with the third and fourth line. We, the third line is okay. We evolve certain behaviors because they, and we say, work well, okay, in circumstances we find ourselves in, okay? That's the only difference between uh, Professor Maskin's approach and the one I'm gonna lay out before you today. Okay, so it comes from evolution, but it's still good, okay? That's contrary to what was said eight days ago, that people's actual behavior is often not rational. We'll show that people's actual behavior almost always is rational, okay? At least in those many cases that we've research program, we can, the behavioral economics literature is very large, so in preparation for this talk, I have not managed to go through it all, mm -hmm. but some of it, okay, we'll see. In short, mainstream economics is based on the premise that people behave rationally, i.e., they act to promote their goals. Behavioral economics holds that people act by rules of thumb, heuristics, and biases. There's no contradiction between those positions. If the rules of thumb promote the goals of their users, then behavioral and mainstream economics are entirely consistent. Indeed, behavioral economics underlies mainstream economics, and that's indeed the case. And just like uh, Professor Maskin said, we're going to talk about evolution. The rules, of th the rules of thumb, the heuristics and biases did not spring from nowhere. That's what we said a while. It's just the same as Professor. It comes from somewhere, okay? It did not spring from nowhere. They evolved, okay? That's also... Behavior comes from evolution. 
Okay. They evolved biologically or culturally. And cultural evolution means, and in, in our case, I think most of the uh, heuristics and biases come from learning. Okay, that is cultural evolution. Learning not in the sense of going to a summer school and <laughs> studying it, yes, and learning it and passing a test. By learning, I mean uh, the results of what you do. If what you do works, and what and you do something else and it doesn't work, then gradually you get to learn what to do right. Learn the rule of thumb. Learn to behave in this way. And I think uh, most of the uh, uh, and you, you may have heard from other people, and say, you know, that other people act in certain ways, so you do also. That's also a kind of cultural learning because they, um, they, uh, uh, they tried it out, and you follow suit. Okay, uh, learning in the sense of this anecdote, there was a professor of psychology, and he said he talked about learning in this sense. Yeah, and. Uh, then when he, he, he wrote on the blackboard, it was back in the days of blackboards, he probably, most of the people here are too young to remember blackboards, yes. <laughs> but uh, uh, he wrote, and whenever he wrote on the left side of the blackboard, uh, the class frowned, you know, they, they did this purposely, okay? They got together without the professor and they decided on this. The class frowned when he wrote on the left side, and when he wrote on the right side of the blackboard, everybody pleased and smiled and nodded his head, and they kept doing that, and they pushed him to one corner of the blackboard, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and at the end of the semester, they told us that, okay, and he was very angry. He should have been pleased because they, you know, they, the things that he said to them, uh, they practiced, but he was a very angry in fact. <laughs> okay? So far, evolution works by survival of the fittest. Rules that don't benefit their users will not survive, okay? And uh, that's cultural evolution and also biological evolution. So far from contradicting each other, behavioral and mainstream economics live in perfect harmony. Indeed, mainstream economics is based on behavioral economics. People behave rationally because of evolution, because it works, okay? Indeed, the founding fathers of behavioral economics, Tversky and Kahneman, themselves wrote this, okay? They wrote it in the original uh, uh, very, um, what's the word, uh, famous paper, okay? Now, uh, seminal, seminal, that's the word. In their seminal paper in Science in 1974, they wrote, in general, these heuristics are quite useful. But sometimes they lead to severe and systematic errors. And from the very beginning of behavioral economics, the in general played a minor role. Okay, what happens in general didn't interest Tversky and Kahneman. Yeah, I love both of them, yes, but... Uh, that's the fact, and 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 their their intellectual descendants also didn't interest them. They su the sometimes took the front seat. The chief concern, the actual chief concern in the behavioral economics literature, is with mainstream economics alleged severe and systematic errors. Okay. So as people indeed often act by rules of thumb. I say that these rules of thumb are almost always beneficial. Almost always. Most of the exceptions known to us are in contrived scenarios. Contrived, not things that don't happen in the real world, okay? And the reason that you get exceptions for that uh, in those scenarios is clear. Contrived scenarios don't occur naturally. That's what the word contrived means. So play no role in the evolutionary process. They don't occur. People, you know, people don't don't they don't meet up with those scenarios in the real world. Okay, so they don't act in those scenarios. So uh, maybe the rules of thumb that have evolved—not maybe, but actually—the rules of thumb that have evolved in uh, 
in the real world uh, uh, are good, but not, not, not when you are faced with a contrived scenario, which doesn't happen. Some of the exceptions are scenarios that, while not contrived, are highly uncommon. And for the same reason, these scenarios, because they're highly uncommon, they play no role in the evolutionary process. Actually, today we're going to talk, I think there's one exception. Almost all of the, uh, thing, uh, the examples we will um, bring are uh, are in contri are contrived, okay? So this talk and tomorrow's talk. I'll finish the introduction, okay? The, uh, uh, the uh, an introduction to the examples I'll give, but almost all the rest of the, uh, today's talk and tomorrow's talk is going to consist of examples. I'm gonna. We have 29 examples. I don't think. Uh, we are going to manage to do all of them, but uh, let's say a few words about the examples. There are two types. <laughs> so in practice, behavioral economics is a collection of rules of thumb, also known as heuristics and biases, each of which allegedly often leads to irrational behavior. Now we're going to adduce examples from the behavioral economics literature and show that in each but one, the observed behavior that prescribed by the rule is either indeed irrational, but the scenario is contrived or highly uncommon, and in commonly occurring scenarios, the prescribed behavior is indeed rational, always. Or the other possibility is that though at first appearing irrational, the prescribed behavior turns out actually on close examination to be rational. And those are many of the uh, BE examples, the behavioral economics examples of this kind. In my examples, it's about half half, a little more on the red side. But uh, some of them are in fact rational, although they seem irrational. We will we'll give some examples of that. And there's one exception in each but one. There's one exception. We'll talk about that exception. In one of our examples, the observed behavior is neither of the above, and we'll talk about it, OK? So. Um, so uh, let's go to the list of 29 examples. I'm going to give a list first, OK, uh, the examples. The first is overeating. The second is hyperbolic discounting, OK? <laughs> the third is uh, discontinuity in behavior uh, when the probability when, when you're going from certainty, absolute certainty, to some degree of uncertainty, OK? Uh, there's a discontinuity there, and that is considered irrational by the behaviorists. There's the ultimatum game, the endowment effect, probability matching. Here's a an interesting one. Mm -hmm. Choosing a higher probability of getting killed in combat. OK, this is a story I heard from Ken Arrow about the Second World War. It's a very interesting story. Uh, anchoring, and these are some of the famous uh, behavioral economics uh, um, phenomena. There's uh, bees, artificial flowers, and nectar. Professor Reinhard Selton's umbrella. <laughs> New York City taxi drivers. That's the green one. OK. Not buying subsidized flood insurance. I heard that from Ken Arrow also. Focusing. Generosity, uh, uh, in other words, the dictator game. Sunk costs. The Christmas gift. Many of these examples are from Dick Taylor's book, uh, 
misbehaving. Okay? I don't like to read technical articles. I read uh, uh, Dick Taylor's book, and he, uh, many of the examples, but by no means all of them. A lot of the examples are from the literature. Mowing your lawn, <laughs> avoiding temptation, discounts, framing, and uh, I have two examples on framing. This is the uh, first example. Left digit bias. Uh, this costs four ninety nine. You won't say it costs five dollars. You'll say it costs four ninety nine. Uh, beer on the beach. That comes from uh, Dick's book. Budget premium gas. Linda. Linda is probably the most famous uh, uh, BE example. One hundred thirty seven equals one hundred percent. It's uh, something about testing. Paying not to go to the gym, F the second framing example, and the last one is trading on the stock exchange, okay? Which uh, uh, Taylor says is irrational. <laughs> and and uh, we'll talk about that, okay? So now uh, we have 29 examples, and um, I don't think we'll finish 29 of the examples. Each one is a full slide, yes? And I don't uh, go through these slides very fast. So uh, um, are there any requests? OK. Any, anybody would like uh, a specific one of the examples? Beer on the beach. Beer on the beach. OK. <laughs> Fine. Here it is. <laughs> OK. Good you picked that, because I don't think we would have gotten to it. <laughs> the, the order that I picked was, uh, was the order in which I was going to present the slides. You see, it doesn't go by number. So it's good you said that, and because we're going to get to it now. So this comes from, uh, this comes from uh, a Taylor's book, Misbehaving. The scenario is you are lying on the beach on a hot, sunny day with only ice water to drink and are thinking about how much you would enjoy a cold bottle of beer. This is a, 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 a quotation from Misbehaving. A, pa a companion goes to make a phone call and offers to bring a beer, and now there are two versions of the the people were asked this, okay? And they were asked, some people were asked one version and some people were asked another version. So one version is they offers to bring a beer from the nearby hotel. He asks for the maximum price you are willing to pay, okay? You want a cold beer, he goes to make a phone call. He doesn't want a cold beer, okay? And, and you, uh, he says, I'm going to the hotel. I don't know how much the beer costs, but how much are you willing to pay? Okay. And the other version is that he says, I'm going to the supermarket. And different people were asked this. Okay. I'm going to the supermarket. How much are you willing to pay? Uh, okay. And now, uh, how much you're willing to pay doesn't depend, shouldn't depend on, on. Uh, um, where you get it from? What difference does it make? You want the beer? How much you want it? You willing to pay a million dollars for the beer? No. <laughs> uh, but it shouldn't depend on whether you get it from a hotel or a supermarket, okay? Nevertheless, the median answers were from the hotel, they were seven uh, euros and 25 cents. And from the uh, uh, from the supermarket, there were four euros and ten cents, okay? 
So there was a big difference, and this uh, seems to tailor irrational. Okay, because it has nothing to do with how much you want a beer, yes, okay. So on the face of it, the young man is right, okay. That's why I put it in blue, okay. But I say he's wrong. The ra this is rational behavior. The rule, the rational rule is and, 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 and not only the rational rule, but the, the behavioral rule, the, the, uh, um, uh, the bias, the, the heuristic, is pay the going price, okay? So the analysis is as follows. In the long run, it pays to have an idea of your purchaser's going price. And as a rule, okay, the rule as a, a heuristic, to refrain from paying much more. People know that the going price at a hotel is more than at a supermarket. You don't live your life figuring out how much you're willing to pay for everything you want to buy, okay? The, the going price, when you go to a store, you ask the man, how much is it, yes? Now, if it's wildly out of the, or if you want to save money, and then, then you, 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 you uh, maybe don't buy the price. But the going price is a, is a, is a big uh, input into your, into your uh, decision as to whether to buy a product or not. So lying on the beach, uh, people know that the going price at a hotel is more than at a supermarket. Lying on the beach, it's not worthwhile to entertain philosophical considerations of how much the beer is worth to you in the abstract. So when you're told that it's being bought in a hotel, you respond accordingly. And when you're told that it's being bought in a supermarket, you also respond accordingly. And that's the right, that's the good thing to do. Okay? Uh, questions. Uh, after each example, uh, I'm going to ask for questions. Yes, uh, yes, sir. So it, it's easy to believe that it's easier to think about what is the going price than it is, you know, it is the thing you're calling thinking in the abstract. Of yeah, the yeah okay. But why is it valuable to the subjects to have a rule of saying, I never want to pay more than 10% above the going price? Why not, why not say, uh, yeah, you that's pay whatever well, they're charging? Okay, that, that's it. that's what I mean by pay the going price. I never well, want to. Pay. That's what I mean by. I don't mean uh, uh, if, if I pay the going price, uh, he 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 doesn't know whether the uh, whether the um, uh, whether how much exactly the hotel is going to charge, and he doesn't know how much exactly the supermarket is going to charge. So he gives an upper range, ten percent above the average price. Uh, that's, what, that's what he was doing. But yeah. the interpretation here is that you don't really want your friend to refuse to buy it if it turns out that it costs more than the four euros and ten cents here. You know, I think you do want the... the you want him not you to want buy the, it. No, I didn't mean... Yes, I, I, uh, it's uh, the, uh, the, uh, the going so. price... Um, Okay, it's, it's, I, sh I should be a little more precise. You're right about that. Thank you. Uh, the going price is not a uh, precise uh, um, number, okay? The going price at a hotel is a range, okay? And the upper end of that range is uh, 725, okay, in your mind, okay? It's a median answer, okay? So different peop people didn't say, I'm going to pay up to seven and a quarter euros, okay? They said different numbers, eight, seven, nine, four, okay? And the median was 725. Uh, so somebody must have said 725, if that's the median, yeah? The median is one of the numbers that they said, right? Okay. Uh, so uh, anyway, it, it, people are thinking of a range, and the guy on the beach picks the top of the range for him, okay, because he wants the beer, <laughs> okay. Uh, so th that's what I meant, okay. Okay. Any? Anyway, yes, sir. Are you going to write down a model that says this is gives me a better payoff than? 
It doesn't give you a, a better. So in what sense is this a better rule than the rule of the rule of what? The rule of telling my friend what I actually value the beer as. Well, you don't know what you actually value the beer as. Yes, you're lying on the beach. You don't want to uh, entertain philosophical consideration of how much the beer is worth to you. Yeah, if he says he's gonna buy it in the hotel, you say, okay, how much does beer cost in the hotel, okay? I want beer and I'm willing to pay the hotel price, okay? But I'm not gonna pay in the supermarket. It, it, you have to realize that in the supermarket, they weren't envisaging going to a hotel, okay? They weren't envisaging, these people were asked separately. The story was, uh, he's gonna make a phone call and offers to bring a beer from the nearby supermarket, okay? So he doesn't envision the hotel, he doesn't have the hotel in mind, okay? He has the supermarket in mind. And he's not gonna start figuring out exactly what it says there, how much the beer is worth to him in the abstract. He, uh, he says, well, supermarkets charge so and so much. If the supermarket charges uh, 10 euros, yes, that's crazy. I'm not going to pay a crazy price for beer. And it's a good idea in general. In general, it's a good idea not to, uh, uh, not to pay. Th this is not, it's not uh, tailored to this event. The rule is a good rule. The rule is a good rule. If I go to a supermarket and I find and I, I find that the the cherries there cost uh, uh, um, say seventy pa uh, uh, shekels, okay? Uh, they cost seventy shekels a pound in the supermarket. I say no, that's a ridiculous price for a supermarket. Yeah, it's a ridiculous price to pay for cherries. For, for cherries in the supermarket, if I would get them in a hotel, maybe, yes. But it, it, it's a good idea, because uh, I've got to go later to a different place and get the cherries for 40 uh, shekels a uh, 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 kilo. Is, is the purpose of not building, I mean, building a reputation for not being a friar? No, 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 no. It's a good way of, of uh, it's a good way of shopping, yes. No, it, we'll have another example of not being a friar, okay? There's another example on my list. But that's, this is not, not, not that. It's just a good, I think it's a good way of behaving, okay? Not to pay too much, yes, for any product that you buy, unless you need it desperately, yes. Okay. It's another question. Yeah. Yeah. So it seems that here the, the, the fact that it's not worthwhile to entertain the thing in abstract is key. So there's an idea of cost that underlies I the think argument. so, yeah, I think Can so. Can you comment maybe on, on that aspect of the argument of the cost? Because um, it seems that it's essential here, that there's a cost to thinking. There's a cost to thinking, yeah, right. Uh, it's... Um, can I... There's a... Sure, I mean, if thinking was costless, then uh, then uh, I guess you would think, uh, I suppose, you might think, I mean, you might not bother with thinking, even if it's costless, but it's not costless, yes. So, uh, so right, I, I think that underlies it. I think that underlies it, the cost of, the, the cost of thinking about it. And I think in general, we don't, uh, we, we ask how much something costs, Okay, when we go to the store, and then we we d we don't figure out how much it's worth to us. Yes, we uh, we at that point we we uh, we uh, say uh, it's it's um, it's. <laughs> Let me put it this way: it, it certainly uh, at. Uh, uh, Going to the hotel is, is worth it to him to pay the seven euros, okay? But it might be that, uh, why, why didn't he say seven euros also in the supermarket? Because that's not <coughs> what he expects to find in a supermarket, okay? He doesn't go to the trouble of thinking, 
what ha what is a, is faced with a problem of buying in a supermarket. Usually when you buy in a supermarket, you don't pay an exorbitant price for one item, okay? At uh, a price that's exorbitant for that supermarket. It's it's a it's a uh, it's a uh, um, it's a it's a heuristic. It's a bias, maybe call it a bias. Okay, you don't go through that. Uh, I, I see you. I see you. Okay, uh, 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 you don't go through that uh, um, through through that. Uh, you don't say, well, what ha what would happen if I would be someplace else? Would I buy this uh, beer at the supermarket? Also, uh, you say, what's an appropriate price for a supermarket? I'm willing to pay a little more, but not much more. And that's a good rule of life. Yes, sir? So is the idea that if you use this rule over and over and over again, yeah. your, like, the, the amount you pay will be lower than if you don't use That's the right. Yes, so you yes, don't yes. The that in the, yes. That's what that's the idea precisely. That's what it says in the first line of the analysis. In the long run, it pays to have an idea of your purchases going price, okay? And because you save money that way, okay? Uh, if if you're in a supermarket, you in in this situation you might it might have been more rational to pay this, but it's not contrived, okay? It's a good rule. What I'm saying in the in the blue uh, uh, in the blue examples, it, it's a good rule. It's not necessarily best in that situation. Okay, it's good as a rule. The rule is a good rule. Okay, uh, and this is not a contrived. Maybe I should have made it red. This is not a contrived example. Uh, it's a natural example. Okay, it's, it's not contrived, uh, but. Uh, but I think you you obey the rule, and the idea is exactly what you say that this way you save money in the long run. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's go back to the list of uh, examples. Just uh, one more question about this. Yes. Because it was? Because it was uh, 20 cents above what you said. Yeah, right. And now another friend going to go. What would you tell him? Uh, your question is, be on the beach. Uh, your question is, it was 20 cents above. Yeah, so your friend returned. He says, sorry, I didn't buy it to you. It's 4.50. Yeah. And then another friend is going to the supermarket. Would you now ask him, you know, get me the beer for 450? Another friend goes to the supermarket. Yeah, would you and, change and, the rule after the And the friend now, now what is the, uh, what's the answer then? So my intuition uh, are you is willing to pay an extra 20 cents? Uh, maybe yeah, my intuition is that I would say, to say yes, to me, why wouldn't cents? you buy to me? For what's 50, that? You know? <laughs> 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 my intuition is that this rule it's not so robust that if a friend come back and he said it was 450, and this is my experience with my going uh, shopping for my wife, <laughs> uh, <laughs> then I know I should buy it. You know, this rule is not a real rule. It's, uh, it's what you say, but you meant I want a beer. <laughs> the, 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 the 725 is already, uh, it's the upper edge of what you're willing to pay, okay? I think maybe. The point is not that, the, okay, the friend comes back and says it was 20 cents more. I didn't buy it. But the point is that not that you have a definite number in mind when you are going to shop. Yes, you, you don't have a number in mind. You take a look at the product that you're shopping for and you, uh, you, um, you say, well, is this too expensive? Is this way out of line? Okay, uh, and and uh, now uh, it, it it probably <laughs> wouldn't make it. The 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 border of way out of line is well, what he said over here. Yeah. So if it's 
20 cents more it wouldn't make a difference in actuality, but that's not the way you think of it. You think of when you're shopping, this is too expensive, it's a euro more, something like that. Yeah. Well, my, my assumption is that this behavior that you capture is some overgeneralization. It's a good rule in many situations, but not in this example. So initially you make a mistake, but if you already have an experience with that supermarket, you say, no, 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 you don't, this rule, let's not use this rule. It's, u it's useful in situation where there's two supermarkets, one next to the other, and then I will use that rule. Uh, and if this supermarket is expensive, I will go to the reasonable one. With high probability, it will be cheaper. But in this example, it's just overgeneralization. It's not. It's a rule that works in many situations. But once we had an experience, it doesn't make sense to continue using it. The question is that uh, 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 once rational once behavior or overgeneralization. And, and, and a friend comes again. Yes, and I, w I would agree. Pay twenty cents. If another friend comes, I, I would agree that he uh, pays 20 cents more. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, let's get back to the... Um, um, one more question. Yes. So to me, there's this kind of core debate of, like, absolute value of an item, like your willingness to pay, like you really deeply think how much it's worth, versus, like, you're suggesting that, oh, it's, it's more beneficial to pay the willing price, but then you kind of stop considering, like, what it's really worth for you, so from an evolution you would think that, oh, actually I shouldn't follow the going price because if someone sets the going price to, like, at a higher level, then you... Yeah, you, you're not, you're not interested in beer at all in that case, okay? If, if, the, if, no. if, uh, if the going price is very high for beer, yes, uh, then maybe you're not going to be in the market for beer, okay? Like, if the going price for a Lafitte Rothschild bottle of wine is $500, okay, then you're not in the market for that. You're not in the market for that kind of wine, okay? You, 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 the, the way you live is you buy things that, in general, you can afford. All right, I think we should continue yeah, this uh, afterwards in the uh, intermission. Or, uh, let's go back to the... Uh, to the example. Are there any other requests uh, over Stock here? Stock exchange. Stock exchange, okay, fine. That's way at the end. Uh, yeah, we'll get to the taxi drivers, yeah. Okay, we, I can do the... <laughs> okay, the behavior that we see is that people buy and sell stock in large amounts, okay? Uh, the behavioral analysis, uh, the behavioral economics analysis and this is, uh, this is from Taylor's book. In a rational world, there would not be very much trading. In fact, hardly any. No agent, let's call him Tom, would want to buy another stock that another agent, Jerry, is willing to sell. Before they could agree on, on a deal, both would think better of it. Tom, realizing that Jerry is a smart guy, would ask himself, why is he selling? Okay? Jerry would think the same about Tom. Why is he buying? Okay? <laughs> so they'd call off the trade. That's uh, more or less a quote with minor changes from uh, uh, Dick Taylor's book. And then he goes on to say that high trading volume may well result from overconfidence. The two happily trade with each other as each thinks he's smarter than the other. Okay? 
Okay. So that's their analysis. That's, where, that's what they say. That's what Taylor says. The rule is, the rule that I suggest is trade and, and what people go by, tra and, and I think it's rational, trade if you think it's worthwhile. Don't worry about overconfidence, okay? If you uh, have analyzed the situation and you think it's a good idea to buy or to sell, okay, then don't say, wait a minute, these economists say that I'm overconfident, so maybe I should think again, all right? And then he thinks again and, uh, and decides, no, it's a good idea. So they say, well, wait a minute, the economists think that he's overconfident, yes. So, not to trade, but it's a good deal. So, let's do our analysis. If Tom and Jerry have different risk attitudes, for example, if Jerry is more risk averse than Tom, then both may well know that a trade is good for both. In fact, that could be common knowledge. That, that, that it's common knowledge that the trade is good for both. A, a, a differing risk attitudes, differing risk at, combined with constantly shifting information may well result in high trading volume. And I'll give a specific example of that. A share of stock, take in this example, it's, it's highly oversimplified, but it, it, it brings out the point. A share of stack or stock will be worth 100 or 200 in the future with probability a half each. Both Tom and Jerry, both the, uh, 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 s uh, uh, the buyer and the seller are risk averse. Okay, for Tom, the certainty equivalent of the gamble is 120. The certainty equivalent of the gamble for Jerry is 140. Although all this is uh, known to both, then Tom sells the stock to Jerry for 130. Both are happy, okay? Tom, uh, uh, who is selling the stock here, I, I mixed up Tom and Jerry in writing this slide. Uh, uh, Tom uh, is holding the stock. For him, it's worth 120. F uh, he happily sells it to, Jer to uh, Jerry for 130. And Jerry, who is buying the stock, he thinks he's getting a good deal because for him, it's worth 140. And what I, suge what I suggest is that this uh, is, uh, is maybe driving all the trading on the stock exchange. Uh, people really think that they are getting, given their information and given their risk attitude, they think it's worthwhile for them, okay? Uh, and uh, um, I, I corresponded about this, this very slide. I corresponded with Taylor last week, okay? And uh, he says that there, there, he, it's not generally known why, but there's a consensus among economists that there's much too much trading on the stock exchange. But I don't see why there, why there is too much trading. There, no, nobody, nobody has spelled that out. Yes, sir? So the scenario that you described depends on the risky assets starting Some information got to be known. Yeah, th that's the uh, 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 differing <coughs> uh, risk attitudes combined with constantly shifting information. Okay, uh, some information got got to be known. As a result of that information, okay, the uh, risk attitudes of Tom and Jerry are as described in the example. Okay. No, both are uh, both are uh, um, 
what change in information, something about the particular stock, something about the company. Something happened in the company, they gave a low report or a high report or something like that, right, yes? So that, that and, that, and, and that changes the risk attitudes of the uh, players, okay? And uh, and uh, uh, and and some some are more risk averse than others, and, and this uh, this could even be common knowledge. Okay. Yes, sir. But if the risk attitudes are constant over time, then the next day nobody's going to want to trade. No, maybe more information comes but to it. Well, maybe it comes to be. Uh, uh, what's that? If it's just information, then they will not want to trade any, anymore. Why? If, if more information can change the uh, can change the uh, um, uh, can change the uh, the not the risk attitude, but it'll change what the the, uh, the the probabilities, the probability distribution in the future. Okay, and it not maybe Tom and Jerry would not trade with each other, but but uh, uh, um, Ruben and Shimon. Okay. So other people will trade, and then and then they'll trade with each other. It's not. Uh, uh, what's your specific question? The no trade theorem says that just shifting information will not make people trade. Once they trade, the, they trade the first the day, and then they are done. Are you talking about the Milgram Stokes yeah. no trade theorem? Yeah. Uh, no, it doesn't apply here. Why? Uh, it, it because. Uh, it has to be common knowledge in the first place that the situation that you are at is optimal. The Milgram tra uh, Stokey trade theorem does not apply here. Okay. In, in, no tra in, in other words, you are trying, this is essentially uh, um, uh, the BE analysis, yes. Is was based on a mistaken uh, uh, conception of the Milgram Stokey theorem. because people get richer and poorer <coughs> and, and, and yeah and the, 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 it's a dynamic world also the composition of the portfolios that each agent has matters to what's the trade composition excuse me so depending on what or the assets they might own might impact what what type of trading they want to do no but in general we have a dynamics that pushes the stocks to people who are less risk of yeah, it could be, but yes, that, but, so uh, but, but what we stop, just heard. We stop or we the, the risk position of a person also depends on hi on him. Yes, and people change. People get richer. People get poorer. Yeah. So all the time, the 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 uh, the, the 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 risk uh, um, attitude of people may change in accordance with their fortunes. Yes? I have a complementary uh, comment that here my understanding is that the context is potentially richer, meaning that it doesn't have to be the risk aversion in a strict utility sense. It might be portfolio related kind of approach that is kind of compare as compared to something that I hold in my portfolio, this particular stock became more risky because the, the information changed about my other assets. That is why I'm, I'm willing to, to trade it. And then in the other circumstance, it will be the opposite. So even, even though my utility is the same, but sometimes I will behave as if I'm risk averse for a particular asset, or I'm relatively risk okay. Then it can shift. Okay. Uh, anyway, there's no consensus on. Thank you. 
there's no consensus on uh, on uh, why there is so much trading in the stock. That's that's what I hear anyway, and. Uh, um, I suggest that uh, it may very well be rational for this reason or for some other. In, uh, in other words, the, the uh, uh, analysis as suggested by Taylor is simply incorrect there. Uh, in this particular example of Tom and Jerry. Okay, I think uh, uh, what uh, we have, uh, we we're almost out of time. Let's go back to. Uh, uh, what's that? Uh, no, oh, uh, one and a half hours. No, we're not almost out of time. Okay. Uh, right. We have another 40 minutes, but I think we should uh, uh, go to... Uh, okay, somebody asked for the taxi drivers, right? Okay. Uh, New York City taxi drivers. The behavior is as follows. New York City taxi drivers set themselves the goal of how much money to earn every day. When they reach the goal, they go home. In good weather, it takes time to reach the goal, so they work comparatively long days. When it rains, there's a lot of demand they reach the goal quickly and are able to enjoy a good rest at home. This is clearly irrational, okay? Uh, analysis. When uh, Professor Maya bar Hillel, who is a member of the uh, Center for the Study of Rationality, which is one flight up from here, uh, told me about this a few years ago, I was really puzzled. It was the first convincing example of truly irrational economic behavior in the real world that I'd seen. It's what people actually do rather than what they say they would do. It's long-lasting, <coughs> systematic, it's not exceptional, not contrived. I frankly did not know what to make of it and started to doubt my thesis. It's a few years ago. More behavior. It ain't so. Okay. It doesn't replicate. It's incorrect. It doesn't have the New York City tra taxi drivers don't behave that way. This is uh, the original uh, example is in a paper of Camera, Babcock, Lowenstein, and Taylor in the QJE in 97. 18 years later, Faber uh, <coughs> carried out and ex he, he reviewed the, the data. He went to New York City and, and he looked at the data and he said it's not so, okay? Uh, the rule is make, just a moment, mm -hmm. make hay while the sun shines, okay? So the rule is to go, to work long days on the rainy days, yes, and not, uh, not according to uh, the uh, um, supposed behavior. My hat is off to Maya, who graciously informed me of Faber's paper. Uh, more analysis. Though Faber's numbers differ very substantially from those of the 1997 paper, the latter, the 1997 paper, is more nuanced than I'd realized. It does differentiate between more and less experienced drivers. As Thaler puts it, well, he puts it in his book, well, cab drivers appear to learn to overcome this bias over time, okay? Uh, he himself says it. In other words, uh, the conclusion is, bravo, evolution works. The cab drivers did not figure this out rationally, okay? And that's what I'm saying all along. They did not figure this out. They learned it. This is a beautiful example of our central 
pieces. Okay? So uh, that's the New York City cab driver. Uh, questions? Okay. Uh, yes? I'm not very familiar with labor economics, but I don't see how this is irrational in the first place. I mean, uh, it's, I think it's very sensible to assume that taxi drivers care about their earnings and their leisure time. I mean, to, to me, a person having earned enough money and going back home to enjoy time with their family is pretty rational. I think it's only irrational in the sense that it contradicts our intuition that the black earth slopes upward. But they, they could they could uh, they could shift. They could go home on sunny days, okay, and and uh, and uh, uh, make hay while the sun shines on rainy days, okay. They could they could get just as much rest, okay. <coughs> if they did not set themselves a daily quota, okay, they could make much more money and get the same amount of rest. I think you can uh, you can get just as mu you, you can get just as much rest as uh, uh, if you go home on sunny days than if you go home on and you don't you don't wait yes it, uh, okay if you don't think it's irrational God bless you yes <laughs> God bless you but but uh, uh, some of us do think it's irrational they do like money yes. Some some taxi drivers may like money. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, that uh, uh, all right. Let's go back. Yeah, it's question. Yes. Yes. I've heard a beautiful story about it uh, that says that uh, the article wasn't replicated uh, not because the situation changed, uh, because aggregators uh, came to the market, and uh, now aggregators like. Uh, Just a moment. Okay, I see you. What? Yeah, in the second uh, article uh, where you said they didn't find this setup, uh, maybe it's just another market. Maybe just uh, taxi aggregators, which now rule everything in this market, they just say. Faber says that in his article? Uh, I, I don't know. Sorry. So it's, I just heard that uh, this story didn't replicate it because of this problem. Well, you know, people can say a lot of things, but, but uh, I looked, uh, I, I didn't study Faber, I didn't do a doctorate on Faber's paper or on, on the uh, Gang of Four paper either, yes? But I did look at them and I don't, I don't remember anything about that. So people can say, uh, people can give a lot of answers, yes? <laughs> but uh, but I, I, think, uh, I think that the fact that uh, uh, Taylor himself says Okay, that what what it, it uh, we did I pass it? Taylor himself says that uh, uh, well, cab drivers appear to learn to overcome this bias, okay? He himself says it. He's the author of the original paper, all right? So uh, I think we're going to cut this, uh, the, uh, the, uh, um, the uh, uh, discussion on this example short at this point. Oh, no, there was one more. Yes.
Yeah, there is. I agree. There is. Uh, there has been some. Uh, um, okay, th this question has has been treated, and th there have been further papers after Farber. But all right, take it for its worth. Okay, I I think uh, Taylor himself. Uh, okay, the. Um, uh, Uh, okay, the defendant himself uh, seems to agree in principle. Okay, let's, uh, I think, uh, let's, uh, uh, we have another half an hour, and I think I will go and now to, um, to, uh, to the uh, order that I planned. We can still discuss each slide for uh, 20 minutes. But uh, l let's uh, go in, uh, in with, with the planned uh, um, uh, sequence of slides. Okay, so we have the endowment effect. And uh, what is the behavior? Subjects first given a Swiss chocolate bar. Uh, this is an experiment, okay? So uh, we're generally, uh, so the subjects were uh, divided into two halves in a random <coughs> fashion, okay? Uh, and they, if they were given a Swiss chocolate bar, they were generally unwilling to trade it for a coffee mug. Where subjects first given a coffee mug were generally unwilling to trade it for a chocolate bar. And it, it seems... Uh, it seems unreasonable that people picked at random that the the the, uh, uh, the people first picked yes uh, uh, and and given the chocolate bar that all of them would really prefer chocolate bar to a coffee mug. It seems uh, it seems uh, um, un uh, uh, it seems strange. Okay. Now, the rule is, the bias, uh, the heuristic, is prefer your own, unless you have good reason not to, okay? So this is a red slide, so I say that in this case, it's really, uh, um, this is contrived, but it's an irrational, uh, uh, it, it, it's uh, irrational, the behavior is really irrational, but uh, but the the uh, example is contrived. So uh, analysis. Already the two thousand year old Talmud notes that a person prefers one measure of his own grain to nine measures of another's. Okay, that's in the Talmud already. Okay. Presumably the reason is familiarity. Would you trade your 2018 BMW for someone else's? Okay, you wouldn't do that. It isn't that people figured this out rationally. <coughs> See, you know, you wouldn't trade your 2018 BMW for another person's 2018 BMW. You prefer your own. It isn't that people figured this out rationally, okay? but that it has worked well for millennia under natural circumstances. Okay, so you, you have internalized the rule. The rule has been internalized. And prefer your own, unless you have good reason not to. And it's automatically applied to trivial, contrived situations like coffee mugs and chocolate bars, where I agree it does not really apply. Okay, in other words, the, these uh, these uh, um, subjects in this experiment were acting irrationally. I agree. Okay, but the rule is a good rule. Prefer your own. Yeah. And okay. Um, uh, questions? Okay. Let's go to the next slide. Avoiding temptation. The behavior, some friends come over for dinner. We're having drinks and waiting for something roasting in the oven to be finished. 
so we can sit down to eat. This actually happened to Dick. He was the host. Yes, okay. Uh, so we can uh, sit down to eat. I bring out a large bowl of cashew nuts for us to nimble on. We eat half the bowl in five minutes, and our appetite is in danger. I remove the bowl and hide it in the kitchen. Everyone is happy. Okay. Now, uh, Taylor writes, this is inconsistent with uh, mainstream economics. Removing the cashews takes away the option to eat more. Rationality prescribes preferring more alternatives to fewer. Okay? It's in his book, page 21. The rule, avoid temptation. Okay? Analysis. People succumbing to, into, uh, to uh, temptation are irrational. They don't fit the definition of rationality because they do not promote their own goals, okay? The, uh, their goal is to wait for the roast, okay? They want the roast more than the cashew nuts, okay? But they can't control themselves. Here the host rationally removes temptation because, in this case it should be he, but I'm succumbing to political correctness, uh, because this really happened to Dick, uh, because she fears rightly that if she does not, the guests will irrationally choose to eat too many cashews. So the, 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 uh, the uh, mainstream economics uh, prescription, yes, is dealing with rational people, okay? It's if you have an option which, it's, uh, which people would choose, like in this case, would the people would choose the option, although it is, uh, uh, it is uh, contrary to their own goals, yes, then it's rational to remove the uh, option. Okay, let's go on. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, people can, yes, what? Your thesis was that people are rational. No, my thesis was that the, uh, not everybody is rational all the time. Certainly a person who commits suicide, uh, well, you know, maybe it could be rational, yes. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, I think the, what my thesis is that the uh, um, heuristics and biases of behavioral economics are good, okay? So, but it, 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 you could have you could have a case where people are irrational, like here, where they eat the cashew nuts in spite of the fact that they prefer the roll. Yes. But to support your thesis, don't you have to explain why evolution leads people to eat the cashews when they're there? Uh, they're hungry. Yes, that's overeating. <laughs> that's another slide. Okay, that's another slide. <laughs> We can go to that, but, uh, but uh, um, in fact, uh, would you like? Well, let, let me, let me. Reason, uh, the reason Taylor quotes this anecdote is to establish that point, that the people are irrational who, who eat the cashews. It's not that he's saying he was irrational to take the bowl away. He's <laughs> saying the guests were happy. That means they all recognize. Okay, I, I, I agree <laughs> with uh, with that the people who, who, who cannot overcome their own uh, <coughs> temptation are behaving irrationally. All right. Okay. But I, I think avoiding temptation is, is, a, is a big subject, and I, I don't understand it, I mean, because everybody agrees that it's better to avoid temptation, that it's rational to avoid temptation. Uh, let's go to Linda. Um, uh, Linda is young, single, outspoken, and very bright. As a student, she was deeply concerned with discrimination and social justice. 
Is it more likely that Linda is a bank teller or that she is a bank teller and an active feminist? Okay. Um, I think most of the people in the room uh, know about Linda. Let me take another example which may be less known about. St. Ives. <coughs> as I was going to St. Ives, this is a nursery rhyme, as I was going to St. Ives, I met a man with seven wives. Every wife had seven sacks, every sack had seven cats, every cat had seven kids. Kids, cats, <laughs> sacks, and wives, how many were going to St. Ives? So, let's do the calculation. Uh, there was the, uh, the narrator is one, the man with seven wives is one, the seven wives are seven, uh, the uh, the uh, seven uh, uh, the seven sacks uh, uh, the seven sacks that each wife had so there were seven times seven sacks and so on and you do the calculation it's 2,802 okay right who says right Pick up, uh, 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 um, raise your hands. Who says wrong? Well, we still have some people on the fence, I see. <laughs> <laughs> okay? So the wrong people are right. It's wrong. The correct answer is one. Okay? He was going to say no. The man was going to St. Ives, so that is, uh, he and the other people were not necessarily going to St. Ives, okay? He met the man with seven wives, but the seven wives, he could have been going to St. 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 what? Barts. <laughs> huh? Barts. Yeah, okay. Here's another example. Why did Napoleon wear suspenders? You know, I, I published a paper on this subject, including <laughs> Linda, <laughs> Linda. I published a paper, and uh, afterwards I'll give you the, uh, the, um, the uh, reference. Uh, and as I was writing the paper, and I, as I was writing the uh, the uh, um, the section on Linda, okay? I quoted this, the section on Linda as I was writing it. A great-grandson, who was at the time he was 13 or 14 years old, or 12 years old, something like that, comes to me and he says, uh, Grandpa, why did Napoleon wear suspenders? Okay? <laughs> so I thought and thought and thought and thought and I could not come up with a reasonable answer, okay? And uh, he answered, so he said, okay, you give up, Grandpa? <coughs> I said, yeah, I give up. The answer is to hold up his pants, <laughs> <laughs> okay? <coughs> uh, so what's driving all these things? What's the rule? the heuristic, the bias. The rule is take what you're told as relevant. If you're given a preamble, if you're told a story, if you're told that why did Napoleon wear uh, suspenders, then you have to, you, the rule is that you think of Napoleon, okay, not somebody else. If you're given the St. Ives, yeah, uh, the, the whole story of the seven wives, the seven sacks, the seven cats, 
you uh, take that as being relevant to your answer. That's the rule. If you're told that uh, Linda is, is well, young, single, outspoken, social justice, discrimination, so on and so forth, yeah, consider that relevant. That is the rule of, of uh, uh, social intercourse. And it is, in fact, embodied in uh, uh, Paul Bryce, uh, about 50 years ago, uh, did research on uh, common, uh, uh, what is assumed in, in language, and he came up with four maxims. And one of them was, be relevant. Make sure that all the, the, the this quote, make sure that all the information you provide is relevant to the current exchange. Omit irrelevant information. And in his book, Studies in the Way of Words, uh, Bryce uses the following analogy to illustrate this maxim. I expect a partner's contribution to be appropriate to the immediate needs at each stage of the transaction. If I am mixing ingredients for a cake, I do not expect to be handed a good book or even an oven cloth though this might be an appropriate contribution at a later stage. In short, Linda is a trick question, okay? Uh, the, the, the questioners did not, uh, um, the, the people who, in, 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 uh, by the way, the, the behavior is that in 72% of the, of the respondents said that she is, it's more likely that she's a back, a bank teller and an active feminist, okay? Which is, of course, illogical. Uh, um, but uh, that, that if you, you, you stop people on the street and you tell them this story and you ask for a, a response, and I've, I've had, I've given this, I gave this example to a collection of students of Cornell University Business school, second year or se third, year, <coughs> second and third year, they were taking a trip to Israel. There was about a hundred of them, and forty of them said, forty of them raised their hands when I said, "Who thinks that it's more likely that she's a bank teller and an active feminist?" It's simply a trick question, okay? And people fall for the trick. Um, so. Uh, okay, let's go. Are there any questions about this? This is the most famous uh, example of uh, uh, Kahneman and Tversky. Okay, we went through the taxi drivers. Ah, we'll get to hyperbolic discounting. Okay. The behavior. Someone offered the choice between $10 today and $11 tomorrow might be tempted to choose the immediate option. However, if asked to choose between $10 in a year and $11 in a year and a day, the same person is likely to prefer the slightly delayed but larger amount. It's a paper in McClure Labor Leibson, Lowenstein, and Cohen, 04 in science. Okay, uh, this is not the result of an experiment, but they quote other experiments, and I, I, I didn't find, I didn't, uh, th this is uh, what they say, they are based on uh, actual experiments. <coughs> okay. The rule over here is a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. It's a famous uh, rule, okay? If you give me $10 now, okay, on the spot, I pocket it, and that's the end of the story. $11 tomorrow, maybe yes, maybe no, maybe you're not in the <coughs> office, maybe uh, you're sick, maybe, uh, okay? $10 now is $10 now. 
there's a qualitative difference between now and later. Between 365 and 366 days, there's no such difference. And I, I assert that this is rational to take the $10 today and not the $11 <coughs> tomorrow. No. In his talk last week, Professor Maskin showed that in spite of its irrationality, hyperbolic discounting has an evolutionary basis. Okay, it's irrational, but it does have an evol evolutionary <coughs> basis. Here we show that this particular instance of hyperbolic discounting, or here we claim, I, we don't show anything, uh, here we assert that this particular instance of hyperbolic discounting is in fact rational, okay? It's rational to take $10 if it's offered to you now and not, uh, uh, and not to wait until tomorrow for the $11. Um, all kinds of things might happen between today and tomorrow. Questions about this? No, so let's go on. <laughs> uh -huh. Yes? This is, okay. I agree with uh, okay, this course. example, but uh, it's a very limited kind of hyperbolic discount. Okay, it's, it's, I think it's, uh, it's the, the most uh, prominent example of hyperbolic discounting in the literature, yes. It's not the, uh, the, uh, the more nuanced uh, examples that you would take about, people talk about less. Well, there, there, there's the Stokes example. Okay, know. fine, yeah, yeah. good. I, I just say that here we show that this particular instance, I, I'm not disagreeing with you, okay, is in fact rational. 100% versus 99%. Behavior, 100,000 euros with certainty might be preferred to a gamble yielding 150,000 euros with probability 0.99 and nothing otherwise. That's the behavior. Rule, <laughs> if you don't know, you don't know, okay? Uh, Analysis. Probability assessments in everyday life are rarely objective, i.e., they're rarely governed by coin tosses, roulette wheels, or the like. Yes, the objective probabilities. When you invite people to an intimate dinner with a handful of carefully chosen guests, and they say 99% they'll come, that means, what it means is 99% they'll come, that they want to be counted in, but themselves reserve the right to opt out. That's what it means, okay? That's what 99% has come into the, uh, in the, the this is the practical meaning of 99% in people's minds. So when they hear the probability 99% of $150,000, they not, not consciously, but subconsciously, they shift into that. It's uncertain. When a contractor tells you that 99% your house will be ready in eight months, you'd better figure at least a year, okay? <laughs> Like the distinction between now and later, which we saw in the previous case in the hyperbolic discounting, there's a qualitative difference in everyday parlance between certainty and probability 0.99. It's not a quantitative difference. The, the, uh, it's it's a, uh, a discontinuity, and it's, it's a discontinuity, it's a rational discontinuity. Okay, that because the, the word ninety nine percent is you're not talking about roulette wheels when you talk where you're talking when you uh, um, or, or uh, coin tosses you're 
talking about the real world, okay? So that's uh, questions about that. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. The ultimatum game. Okay. The game consists of two players, the proposer and the responder. And in the game, the proposer and the responder must divide 100 euros. If they agree how, each gets his agreed share. If not, both get nothing. They sit at computers in separate rooms and cannot communicate directly. The proposal starts by making a numerical offer to the responder without words, okay, on the computer. The responder responds by clicking yes or no. No other response is possible. The game is then over, that's the whole game. The players get their payoffs, okay, if uh, if the responder agreed to the proposal's proposal and leave by separate doors. They never see each other, nor do they learn <coughs> each other's identity. The subjects are students. They're not particularly long on money, okay? This is an experiment. Now, uh, this, uh, an experiment like this was performed by good, uh, uh, and his, uh, his uh, partners, and it was published in 1982 in the Journal of Economic Behavior and Organization. Now, what's the rule? What's going on here? The rule is most proposers offer the behavior, oh, sorry, not the rule, the behavior. The behavior is that most proposers, this is done on many uh, uh, subjects. Most proposers offer around 35. Smaller offers, say 20, are rejected. Okay? And what's the rule? The rule is don't let people kick you in the stomach. Reject lopsided offers. That's the rule. Analysis. The mechanism for executing the rule is feelings of wounded pride, insult, desire for revenge, honor. The rule and its mechanism evolved in natural scenarios where the negotiators know each other. Okay? If in such scenarios you accept lopsided offers, you'll get a reputation for doing so. And in the future, we'll get only such offers. So rejecting is highly rational. In the contrived artificial ultimatum game, reputational effects don't apply as the players are totally anonymous. They don't know each other, okay? They don't see each other. They, don't, they interact only with this computer in separate rooms. But the rule and its mechanism evolved in natural scenarios where they do apply, okay? And in the, uh, if, you, you, if you accept lopsided offers, you'll, you'll, in the future you'll get only lopsided offers. So the rule is rational in spite of its irrationality in the contrived ultimatum game. Somebody asked before about about uh, uh, about uh, reputation. Somebody, I, f I forget exactly. Anyway, this is the uh, treatment. Of it. Okay. So, uh, uh, are there is there any questions about this? The people are. I've uh, got tired of asking <laughs> questions in the first two or three slides. Yeah. Okay, fine, fine. All right, we'll continue this tomorrow, and uh, 